today we're going to start a new type of video here on If Dust Could Talk. And first of all, I have to ask you to forgive me. I've been sick all weekend, so I know that my voice is pretty scratchy right now. But I'm really passionate about this and really wanted to share this story. So this new segment or this new type of video is going to be called Forgotten Church History. And in this, we're going to talk about stories from past church history that have almost all but been forgotten by the church as a whole. Very few people know that these stories ever even existed. And these are the stories that I especially love because they aren't the ones that have been retold over and over and over again. Not to discredit any of the other amazing people like John G. Lake or your uh, D.L. Moody's, people like that, which I'm sure we'll talk about in other episodes. But I especially love the ones that we haven't heard of that were incredibly powerful. As a matter of fact, today, we're going to be talking about a man named John Welch, or John Welsh, as he's also known, who literally saved cities through the power of prayer, not just from war, but from plagues. He was an incredibly powerful prophet that city leaders depended on to pray to God and get answers for direction for the entire city. So today, we're going to tell his story. You are going to be blown away. I hope it impacts you. So let's just jump right in. I'm going to go from the beginning of his life all the way to the end. So here we go. Now, John Welch, he was born in Dumfries. Shire in the county of Dumfries of Scotland around the year 1570. Now, just to give you some context about what was happening in the world right now, the world was changing dramatically. Christopher Columbus had just discovered America in 1492. The Reformation had taken place in the year 1517, just 53 years before John Welch was born. Even though the Reformation had begun, there were still incredible moves and incredible conflict between the Reformers and the Catholics. It was There was wars going on because of all of this, as we'll see a little bit later on here. Um, and there was incredible division in Europe because of the Reformation. Now, Martin Luther himself died in 1546, but the Reformation movement, it was still moving very, very powerful. As a matter of fact, most historians consider the Reformation to have formally ended in about 1648, which means that John Welch was not only born in the heat of the Reformation, but he died while it was still going strong. So in 1570, there was a whole lot going on in the world when baby Welch was born. I mean, Ivan the Terrible supposedly became a Protestant Christian that year, even though he was a terrible warlord. He killed his own son just a few years after converting to Christianity. So I don't know how legit that was, but that that's how political Christianity had become at that time. People would choose either between Catholicism or Protestantism. Armies would form behind whether you were a Catholic or a Protestant. Now, John, he was born in a really wealthy family, but he was never a well-behaved kid. His parents put him in grammar school, which back in those days in Scotland and England, that was the preppy school for rich kids. These were the kids who were homeschooled for three years and then sent to this grammar school where they would be taught all kinds of higher, in their opinion, higher, higher level learning. They would learn Latin. They would learn how to become Catholic. Catholic priests. They would, be, they would be taught all of these, the modern science and, and philosophies of the day. And in those days, becoming a Catholic priest was like the high level, high paying job. Like if you wanted to make a lot of money, you became a Catholic priest because the Catholic priests, they were, they were filthy, stinking rich. And so a lot of wealthy families, they would put their children through grammar school to become Catholic priests, even though they weren't believers, even though their kids weren't believers. It was a sheerly, largely political position. Now, John, he did not appreciate this. He had no interest in becoming a priest. So he would frequently run away from school and eventually actually ran away and joined a gang of thieves living on the border of England and Scotland. And the way that he would survive was by stealing from travelers who, or tourists or whatever, whoever was crossing the border, they would waylay them on the road, steal everything, and then live off of what they stole. Now, John Welch became 100% the story of the prodigal son. After living on the border for so long and living in crime for so long, he ended up becoming so destitute and poor that he decided he wanted to return back and live with his father again and that he would indeed become a Catholic priest as his parents wished. However, he was too scared to go see his father in person, so he went to go stay with his aunt, whose name was Agnes Forsyth. And he stayed with her for a while, trying to convince her to talk to his father to see what his father thought about him and if his father would have any interest in him coming back. Now, one day, John's father came to visit Agnes, his sister, and John, he ran into another room and hid and listened in on the conversation. During that conversation, Agnes tried to slip in and ask about John. And so she asked the father, you know, what did he think John was doing, if you'd heard any news? And John responded this way. He said, oh, cruel woman. How can you name him to me? 
The first news I expect to hear of him is that he is hanged of a thief. Now, she responded to him, basically, that people can change. And maybe he had become a, a, a righteous man or a virtuous man. And so after hearing this, the father started to wonder why she was bringing this up and asked her if she had heard anything about John's whereabouts. At which point she finally revealed that she did indeed know where John was and that he had in fact changed and was a righteous man now who wanted to change his life and reconnect with his father. And with this signal, John Welch ran into the room, greeted his father and basically said, here I am. He fell on his knees. He begged his father for forgiveness. At first, his father started to rebuke him and threaten him, but his sister Agnes calmed him down and convinced him to give his son another chance. And especially seeing his son's tears was what convinced him that he truly was changed. So he decided to give him another shot and he sent him back to grammar school. And John worked so hard, even though he had missed time, he ended up becoming the youngest graduate in his entire class. He was said to be exceptionally smart, and he graduated Edinburgh University in August 1588 at just 18 years old. And from there, he was sent out straight into ministry. 18 years old, he was sent out to a town called Selkirk, which was a little further north. It was still in southern Scotland, but further north from where he lived. And this place has, for all of this time, has always been a really small town. As a matter of fact, in the most recent census that I've been able to find, the town there only has 5,784 people living. And while John was there, this was still right in the middle of the Reformation. So there were all of these Protestant churches that had been founded, but they didn't have any pastors over them. There was extreme persecution from the Catholic church there against the Protestants. And so there were especially five specific churches that didn't have any pastor over them because they'd been planted. The pastors had either, either been kicked out or killed or something. They had left for some reason. And so John, at 18 years old, was made pastor of all five of those churches. He begins his ministry, and whenever he finally really gets started, he had turned 19, he was single, and he was living with another reformer, another reformed man, they called him, whose name was Mitchell Hill. And John, he had gone completely the opposite way. From being this vagabond, this vagrant who was living on borders, robbing people to survive, Welch went the complete opposite way. He was known as a man of incredible discipline. He would go every single day, seven days a week, to preach in each one of those different churches, switching them out every single day. And these were small churches, okay? This was, like I said, right in the middle of the Reformation. The Reformation was still, it was big, but it wasn't popular just yet, especially not in this part of Scotland. And so he would have a handful of, of Reformed people come in, but a lot of the people who came to these churches, they were Catholics who just came to either argue with him or to heckle him or just to cause problems within the church. And so John's only real way to respond to this was to draw even closer to the Lord. And so I want to read, this is from his biography. It says right here, a boy who was living there retained a respect for John Welch and his ministry his whole life. His custom was, this is talking about John, when he went to bed at night, he would lay a Scots plaid on his bedclothes. From the beginning of his ministry to his death, Welch considered the day ill spent if he was not in prayer for at least one third of his time. So this is how John Welch divided his day. He would give eight hours to people, eight hours to prayer, eight hours to sleep, which is a pretty fantastic way to divide your time, especially if you're a minister. That gives you time for everything. Eight hours in prayer, you're going to change some nations if you're doing that. Here's another quote from a different man whose name was Ewart, or Ewart. I don't know how it's spoken. He says, an old man called Ewart, who remembered Welch, said he was a type of Christ. That's a really, really big thing to say about somebody. But he said this because Welch had commanded so much respect from his ability to hear the voice of God, and he was very well known as a prophet, which we're going to see in a little bit. So throughout his entire ministry, he faced incredible persecution, especially because the Protestants in those days, they were largely protesting the wealth of the Catholic Church. And so a lot of the Protestants, they lived in incredible poverty and wouldn't even take up offerings. They would maybe hang a box on the side of the church for people to come put money in voluntarily if the spirit led them to, but they didn't ever try to pressure anyone into giving because that's what the Catholics did. And so if he saw someone, especially someone who claimed to be a Christian, dressed in nice clothes or living above what the common man lived, he would rebuke them pretty, pretty solidly, which was most of the Catholics in the area. And so there was a man named Scott of Headshaw, 
and he had had a run in with John. He was a wealthy man that John had rebuked. And so Scott, he went and he chopped the hindquarters <laughs> off of John's horse. He basically chopped the horse in half and killed it. And the persecution got worse and worse until John finally had to move to another area. He could no longer live in Selkirk. Now from there, he went to a place called Kirkudbright, which took him further south than Scotland. And he ministered under a man named Samuel Rutherford, who was a very famous reformer. And he was there for a little while. It didn't go very well for him. He wasn't very successful. And as a matter of fact, there's a funny story. He met a man whose name was Robert Glendening. And Robert was a Protestant minister who was dressed in very fancy clothes. And John meets him on the street, finds out that he's a Protestant minister, and immediately starts rebuking him for dressing the way that he was. He's telling Robert he needs to stop focusing so much on his clothing and start to think more about reading his Bible and studying the Word of God and learning to live like Jesus. And as a result of this whole conversation, this apparently random confrontation on the street, he finds out that Robert was the one that had been sent to replace him in his ministry because he wasn't very popular there. And that's essentially how he was replaced in Kirkudbright, and he was sent somewhere else to minister. Now, don't feel too bad for John, because in Kirkudbright is where he met his beautiful wife, who was, believe it or not, the daughter of the mega-famous, mega-influential John Knox, who we will almost certainly talk about in another episode down the road. Now, over the next few years, John's life was just full of all kinds of different adventures, and he was always controversial as is the case with pretty much any reformers or anyone who makes any kind of a difference, there's going to be some conflict wherever they go. One example is in December of 1597, he was asked to speak at a gathering of ministers in Edinburgh, and it was there that someone from that whole council, from that whole conference, they claimed that John said during the conference that the king of Scotland was possessed by a devil, by a demon, and that all the seven council members who gave advice to the king were also possessed by a demon. According to John, this was not true. He never said that. But regardless of whether he said it or not, the report got back to the king, and the king sent messengers summoning him to the court to face the king himself. And John, being convinced that he was going to be executed by this, he fled and went into hiding. And he remained in hiding for six months until the king finally exonerated him. Now, finally, in the year 1600, John moved to the city of Ayr. Now, John Welch is also known as John Welch of Ayr or John of Ayr. And because this is where he finally found his footing. He was only 30 years old. And this is where he found really his calling. And Ayr was a place that was full of gangs and full of violence. And so John, he was so crazy. These gangs would be fighting in the streets. John would put on a knight's helmet, run into the middle of the street in the middle of these fights, and he would make the gang stop. He was so respected as a prophet, they would, they would stop, they would listen, and then he would put up a table. He would set up a table in the middle of the street, put a meal on it, and make these gangs sit down and have a meal together, and then declare each other friends. And he would stop gang wars and shut down gang violence by making them do that. And after that, they would have worship together. <laughs> it was incredibly powerful. Let me, let me read you this quote. After the people began to notice what Welch was doing, and after listening to his heavenly doctrine... They quickly came to respect him. He became not only a necessary counselor, without whose advice they would not do anything, but also an example to imitate. And John became especially known in this time as a prophet. For example, there was one case where there was a very wealthy man who used to host soccer games on Sunday while John was holding church services. So John sent him a letter warning him that if he didn't stop disrupting the services of the Lord, that the Lord was going to bring punishment on his house and that he would lose everything. The man essentially laughed at the letter, ignored him, and once again continued doing what he was doing. Uh, he was hosting these soccer games that were very disruptive to the services, and people were choosing to go to the soccer games instead of going to hear John preach. So then John one day just showed up on the man's doorstep with a prophecy, and he said that because he had ignored the advice given to him from the Lord and would not stop profaning the Lord's day. Therefore, the Lord would cast him out of his house and none of his children would enjoy it. And that happened immediately. The man lost everything he had and came and repented to John, asked for forgiveness and was saved himself. 
Another thing about John, he never slept a whole night. He said that he could not believe that any Christian, any sincere Christian could sleep an entire night without waking up at least once to pray. That's how dedicated he was. And his wife, Elizabeth, she often told others how she would wake up in the middle of the night, find her husband not in bed, and she would go to his office or his prayer room and find him laying on the ground groaning, Lord, won't you give me Scotland? He was so completely consumed with the presence of God and the love of God that he would glow oftentimes. There was one, there, there were several witnesses to this. In one particular story, his wife Elizabeth had invited a bunch of neighbors to come over to have like a little get together, you know, small group, whatever you want, whatever you want to call it. And John, he, he wasn't a people person. And so he wanted to go spend some time alone in prayer. He went out into his garden where he didn't think anybody was watching. And he just sort of slipped out quietly. The people in the party, they eventually started asking, where is John? Where is John? And they look out the window to the garden and they see a shaft of light coming down from heaven right on John and they can see John illuminated in the middle of his garden glowing like a light bulb in the middle of the garden in prayer and multiple people saw this and this happened multiple times throughout his life where people would see him actually glowing whenever he prayed. Also during his ministry time in Ayer the bubonic plague was sweeping across Europe and most of the towns were going into quarantine their gates would completely shut down nobody was allowed in or out and Ayer was one of those towns. The only people who could get in or out would have some kind of authorization from the king of Scotland or England or, or some higher authority. If they had that paper, then they would be allowed to come in. One particular night, two merchants showed up to the city of Ayr and they had documents sealed, signed from the king saying that they had permission to come into the town. However, the guards of the gate had word from, from the mayor of the town that they had to get permission from John Welch before they could let anyone in because John had to consult with the Lord. So these two merchants show up. The guards say, sorry, we have to go talk to John first. They go to John. John comes out to the gate. This is the middle of the night. The merchants are there not understanding. They've got their papers. They've got their packs with all their, go with all their goods. And this is what his biography says. Taking off his hat, he looked up towards heaven. After a short space of time, he told the magistrates that they would do well to discharge these travelers from their town, affirming that the plague was in the packs of cloth. So the magistrates commanded them, the merchants, to be gone. They went to Cumnock, a town about 20 miles away, and there sold their goods, creating such an infection in that place that the living were hardly able to bury their dead. This made the people begin to think of Welch as an oracle. Yet, though he walked with God and kept close to him, he did not forget man. Now, it was at this same time in 1604 that King James commissioned the King James Bible to be translated. Yes, this is that King James. Now, I got to warn you, this is the part that might make some of you mad. This is not my fault. This is just history. Many of the Protestants really disliked King James. They did not believe that the King James Bible was holy. They actually thought it was corrupt. They thought it was sheerly political. And John Welch was one of those people. As a matter of fact, the reformers, the majority of the reformers, did not use the King James Bible. They used the Geneva Bible. The Geneva Bible was the one that was actually translated by the reformers, while the King James Bible was translated by King James and his, and his people. So a lot of the Protestants actually saw the King James Bible as the corrupt version, as the political version, and the Geneva Bible was the one of the actual Protestants, because they're the ones who actually translated it. It was also common knowledge among those times. It was commonly accepted knowledge that King James was a practicing homosexual. He had several lovers. He also severely persecuted the Protestants, including John Welch, as we'll see. And so they did not see him as a benevolent king. As a matter of fact, let me read you a quote on King James from the Protestants. It says, the reason why James VI was so set on the bishops, meaning why he was so taking the side of the Catholic bishops, was neither their divine institution, which he denied they had, nor the prophet of the church, which he would gain from them. For he knew well both the men and their communications, but merely because he believed that they were useful instruments to turn a limited monarchy into absolute dominion and subject them into slaves. Always in pursuit of this design, he resolved first to destroy general assembly the Protestants, knowing that as long as they assembled freely, the bishops could never get their designed authority in Scotland. 
So this is basically saying King James was set on destroying the reformers so that the Catholic priests could have control and therefore he would have ultimate control because he controlled the priests. So because of this, King James was constantly being confronted by the Protestants. As a matter of fact, there was one particular service where King James went to a Protestant meeting and he was rebuked so harshly that he began to cry openly in the meeting. So because of all this, King James persecuted the church more and more and more. John Welch was one of the people that he persecuted. And so one night, James was out in his garden praying, glowing as usual. He didn't come inside and he was out for much longer than usual. So finally, his wife came out and asked him why he was taking so long to come inside and go to bed. And he told her that it was because the Lord had just revealed to him that he would never preach in Scotland again. A few days later, he was arrested by King James and he was sent to Blackness Castle. It's where some of the most famous reformers were imprisoned and eventually executed. However, John was not executed. He was kept in prison for quite a long time. It was a really rough imprisonment. It caused permanent damage physically to him. And then he was exiled to France. And miraculously, when he arrived in France, God gave him the language and he was able to preach in French within 14 weeks of being there. There were a lot of other miracles that happened. We don't have time in this video to go through all of them. I mean, he raised the dead. He did all kinds of incredible things. But I want to share one last miracle with you to close this out. So while John was living in France, he once again became a minister. And he was ministering in one particular city that was at war with King Louis XIII. And King Louis's army completely besieged the town, the, the city that he was in. And the battle was so fierce that one night a cannonball tore through the side of his house and ripped his bed out from under him. And he was unscathed, but his whole bed was destroyed. Now, there was one particular day the battle was so ferocious. And yet John, he went on to the wall where the French army was trying to, to invade the city and the people of the city were fighting against them. John got on that wall and started to preach to both sides of the army. And as he was preaching, both armies stopped fighting, sat down and listened to him preach. So the Duke who was leading the French army, he went back to King Louis and the King of course asked him, why did you stop attacking the city? And he said this, never a man spoke like this man. So King Louis, he had to know who this John Welch was. So he sent an invitation to John to come meet him in his tent. John went and the French king asked him why he should be allowed to preach on the walls or anywhere. And John responded like this. He said, sire, if you did right, you would come hear me preach and you would make all of France hear me preach too. For I preach that you must be saved by the death and merits of Jesus Christ and not by your own. And I preach that as you are the king of France, you are under the authority of no man on earth. Those men who hear you subject you to the Pope of Rome, which I will never do. And the king replied, well, well, you shall be my minister. And so as a result of this meeting, King Louis, he actually lifted his siege of this city in France. He left them to freedom. So John went back into the city and he then declared to the city that they were free from the siege. But kind of like Jonah, he told them that if the city didn't repent, that God would send Louis back and destroy the place. The city did not repent. And Louis did come back a time later while John was still living there. And as he was attacking the city, Louis sent in an elite force of soldiers to get John out of the city right before he destroyed it. Thus, John was spared and the city was destroyed. So at the age of 52, John's body was completely destroyed with all of the hardships of his life, with his imprisonment especially. It just, just destroyed him in so many ways. He could barely breathe. And so he said that he felt like the only way he could get better is if he could breathe the air of Scotland again. And so his wife and friends, they went to King James, the King James of the Bible, and asked him if he would have mercy and let John Welch return to Scotland one last time to breathe the Scottish air. And this is what King James responded. He said, give him the air, give him the devil which was thus saying, no, you can't come back. However, they did manage to convince him to let him go to London at least one and preach one last time. And it's interesting because the King James said that he would allow John Welch to return to London if he promised to die after preaching that one last time, to which John agreed. John then went to London and preached his very last sermon, which they said he preached long and greedily because he just, he wouldn't get down. So he probably preached for hours and hours. He came down, he left the pulpit, 
went home, laid down, and just released his spirit, and he died at the age of 52. I hope this story has been inspirational to you and that you've learned something new about this amazing God that we serve and the people who have served him that we have forgotten about throughout the years. If you did, please let me know if you know of anybody else in church history like this that maybe has been forgotten, and maybe I'll do an episode on them. I hope you subscribe and like, and I hope to see you in the next video.